Hey there, and welcome back to the Total Potential Podcast here with Cole today. And I'm so excited to be with our guest, Dr. Irene Kopp today, who's an MD and a chiropractor and an acupuncturist and all these wonderful things that that in and of itself I'm so interested in uh, as a body of work. But I'm um, really excited to, to share with you today her, her focus of work now, which is the sh- um, Stress to Success Shift Institute. And I just, guys, we're all parents. And it's, there's a lot in the realm of raising kids and keeping a house and going to work and all of those things. And so I'm just so thrilled to be able to share um, Dr. Irene's message with you today. So Dr. Irene, thank you so much for being here with me. Mm, It's totally my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Cole. I'm so interested to know. So this first like section of your life of work and uh, interest in the human body and caring for people, like what led you even down that path to begin with? Mm. So a really good question. And so fun fact that I don't usually bring up with a lot of people is that my mom was head of our medical records in our local hospital. And she was a single mom. So I literally, and at that time, you know, daycare was not a thing. In fact, even though she was the head of a department, she literally made less than the poverty line, you know, wage disparities, can we say? And so she couldn't afford a babysitter. So I would go with her seven o'clock every morning to the hospital and hang out while she did her work. And, and when I say hang out, let's just say that I, I, I explored every inch of that hospital <laughs> like, to this day. I probably know more of the corners and, you know, the nooks and crannies of that hospital than maybe the maintenance guys, just saying, <laughs> you know, it's just, I love so it. I grew up around it. And at that time, the doctors would come in and they would, you know, they would dictate their, their notes right there because we didn't have otter. Right. So <laughs> it was, you know, her whole team, what their whole soul, well, not their only job, but their, their, one of their main roles was transcribing and typing out all of the doctor's notes and sticking them in the files. And you had like these reams, these, these shelves upon shelves upon shelves of, of files. So I would help her, I would hear the doctors and yeah, I just, it was part of that growing up. And I learned early on, doctors get a lot of respect. Mm. Doctors get a lot of respect. So I think in the very beginning, I could tell that they were the head honchos and I wanted to be the head honcho Mm. (laughs) because I didn't like taking orders even then. Just saying, yeah. you know, it, it's, a, it's a fact I'll, I'll own it. Yeah. So, so that was, that was the initial, like, so even as a child, if you looked at what I did when I was going through high school and everything, everybody thought I was going to be a journalist or a musician thing is my parents wouldn't let me go to school for music. Oh, interesting. So even though I begged, just like, well, let me do a double major. No how about a minor in music? No. Right. So it was, it was like, okay, so what else am I going to do? So I majored in human biology and, you know, I guess you could say the the rest is history. Yeah. That that's, that's how I ended up there. And I don't regret it. I don't regret it in the slightest. Yeah. What a dynamic, uh, early influence and how that then kind of like transitioned into something later in life. It's always so interesting how those paths wind around, um, in your career, like in caring for patients or clients, like what, what did that environment look like for you? Were you raising a family at the time? Like what were, what were the dynamics that became present as you like sunk into early career life? Mm. Awesome questions. So going back and it was, it's, it's something we all face, I think even now, and that is, you know, how do you juggle 
family and career and personal life and yourself. There was no yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It was, and I thought I had it all figured out. I was going to graduate when I was 26. I was going to get married, you know, and, and have my first kid when I was 30. I was, I, I had it all lined out and I actually did. I actually <laughs> got married when I was 26, had my first child when I was 30, you know, and then it kind of derailed after that <laughs> because guess what? Life doesn't go according to plan and, and families don't go according to plan. It's like, you can't do that. At least I was never able to with kids. Mm, yeah. So, and then unfortunately, again, you know, a usual statistic, I ended up the statistic of, of being separated and divorced. So I was a single mom juggling a full-time practice and, and being full-time mom and being, you know, trying to do it all. Yeah. Yeah. That trying to do it all is, um, mm, there's a lot of pressure to do that. And there's a lot of, um, especially now, you know, in the world of social media, like a lot of uh, images that suggest that we can and should and have to do it all. And the messaging is so bananas to me, but we'll, I th I, we'll get there, I'm sure. But okay, so as you're juggling a practice and family life and all of the pressures, like, what does that start to look like? What, where you said derailed, like how, in what ways, what started happening that derailed that? Mm, great questions. And, you know, I'll just back up really quickly and say that, yeah, it's, we were, we were programmed to believe that we should be able to do it all. And because it, I, I know you're a lot younger and there was this, this commercial that I remembered and it was like this woman, you know, in, in a, like a suit, you know, blouse and skirt and high heels. And she has a frying pan. She goes, I can bring home the bacon <laughs> fried up in the pan. In other words, doing it all. Like yes. it, it was just right. And that's how we were expected to move and groove right? <laughs> that we could bring home the bacon, we can fry it up in the pan, we can look after our kids, we can bathe them, we can put them to bed, we can do, we can clean the house, we can like, you know, going back even further to the 50s, we can be like June Cleaver, you know, do it all perfectly with a string of pearls and, you know, never mess up our hair. <laughs> that takes some serious <laughs> hairspray. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So where did it start to derail? For me, honestly, there was no start to derail. Mm. I just literally hit the wall. Mm. I crashed and burned, literally. And that's because I had developed physical burnout and didn't know it. Mm. And I literally hit the wall. I lost consciousness while driving with my two young children in the car. They were four and six. And as I lost consciousness, the road curved and I kept driving straight at full speed into one of those massive three-story high rock faces in Northern Canada. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So and actually hit the wall. Literally. And I broke 10 bones. I had to be cut out with the jaws of life. That wasn't the most painful part. The most painful part was that, as I said, my four and six-year-old sons were in the car with me. And my six-year-old son basically automatically had PTSD because the scene was apparently so horrific that adults were throwing up at the scene and he oh. witnessed it all. My four-year-old son suffered a catastrophic brain injury oh. and I had to be airlifted to the nearest pediatric hospital three hours away. So for about two to three weeks, even after emergency life-saving surgery, we weren't sure he was even going to live. So here I am 
lying in a hospital bed all by myself. Couldn't have visitors because it was long enough ago that it was the first SARS. So COVID mm. is a SARS vaccine, a various, so the various virus. So they couldn't call it SARS-2. That would be too confusing. So they just called it, they called it COVID instead. So the very first SARS, I was in hospital on quarantine, couldn't see anyone, couldn't see my sons. My other son was in a different hospital and I'm just receiving these garbled reports because for a while, a good couple of weeks, they didn't even know there was a mom in a different mm. hospital. Like just, it was a, a very strange time. And I was going crazy for fear because I was also receiving reports from my son's school and, and others that my six-year-old son was being suspended from school like every single day. He was threatening to hurt himself. He was threatening to hurt others. He was throwing chairs. He was just like, and so I'm hearing all of this and I'm absolutely powerless to do anything about it. And I was literally being sucked down into a quicksand of guilt mm. and remorse and shame and wondering, you know, what kind of monster was I to do this to the most, two most important souls in the universe to me. Mm. And it truly was the darkest day of my life the darkest time and you know my inner judge and jury <laughs> was you know yeah you know what you don't deserve them you're dangerous you're incompetent mother you're incompetent doctor how could you not know how could you not know and I was literally lying by myself. Well, I was on total bed rest, couldn't move because of the broken bones. And I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm not a pretty crier like, you know, Demi Moore or whoever. <laughs> and so I was literally bawling and crying out, why me? Why me? And I realized I had a choice. I had a choice that I could continue being sucked down and completely agree with, you know, that inner judge and jury that had already tried and convicted me. Or I could realize that I was just one of hundreds of millions. And we can literally say now with the last couple of years of COVID, one of billions who are on that slippery slope to burnout or who have hit the wall and it just shows up differently for them. Yeah. And that I could either continue to judge myself or I could give myself the grace to understand that I, I did what I thought was best. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? So yeah. Steve Jobs said you can only connect the dots going backwards or looking backwards. And so I decided that with my clinical experience, my education, and now personal experience, that I was the best one to help as many people as possible. And I made that decision that day that if I could help one person, one family avoid the suffering that my family did, or worse, then I would be successful. That burnout was and I'll use the word because this is what I used at that time in my mind. Burnout was an epidemic, hmm. even at that time, a silent epidemic that was condoned and accepted and expected by our society that we are programmed to give and give and give until we're bled dry, that we somewhere along the line from, you know, a baby, this beautiful baby who is born is perfect just as they are and, you know, have their innate genius and talent and potential, right? Somewhere along the line, we're taught by, I'll say, other broken people and, and communities and cultures 
that you have to achieve to prove that you are valuable, that you are worthy, that you are lovable. Yeah. And that really we were expendable. And that is one thing I can say for certain. I had been programmed to believe that I was inexpendable. I wanted, I wanted to believe that I was inexpendable. And guess what? I found out that I was totally expendable to every single person on the face of this earth, except two people. Right? Yeah. In other words, it was a huge wake up call for me that yes, society needs to change their gauntlet mentality and their approach. What I also realized was that as I was crying, why me? Part of that why me was why me? I'm a doctor. I have more nutrition training than most other professions. I had, in other words, I ate right. I exercised. I was a neurophysiological meditation instructor before ever becoming a doctor. <laughs> I did, you know, I did yoga. I did everything right. Aside from, you know, any parent with young kids, you know, perhaps, you know, you don't get as much sleep as you should. And what I realized was that even though I had done everything right, I still hit the wall and I couldn't blame anybody out there. I had to look in here mm -hmm. and understand that I had been set up for failure by the programming from well-meaning parents and families, communities, our religions, our cultures, <laughs> Everybody was telling us these and teaching us that we need to achieve to be worthy. Right. And then you add in that I came from a, a very abusive childhood because <clears throat> my father had PTSD because of atrocities he experienced and witnessed during his tour of tours of duty. And so I learned very early on, it's only safe to show up if you're perfect mm. and that if you soothe the waters and you keep everybody happy because if you don't keep everybody happy somebody might get hurt mm. right so and then you add in Cole you know I, I love your male listeners and I have two sons and still to this day there's far more programming put on females to, to give, give, give until they're bled dry, to be in savior syndrome, uh -huh. right? That it's selfish for us to think of ourselves first. Yeah. Right. And so I realized that the combination of what I'll call glitchy programming and the traumas that I had experienced were massive energy drains, like energy vampires, like, you know, the dementors of Harry Potter, just <laughs> sucking the light right, life right out of you so that you could do everything right and you could still crash and burn. Oh. It's like having a high performance sports car and you're putting the best fuel in and as much fuel as the gas tank will hold, but you got like a leak in the fuel line. Oh. Right. It's just, it was, yeah. it was that, that whole, so in other words, there's that part of being set up for failure. Yeah. I think that's going to resonate with a lot of our listeners and, um, you know, hopefully an opportunity to recognize, like if you are inching toward that, like, I'm going to call it a rock bottom moment because I think we meet lots of different types. I mean, for you, you had a very specific and traumatic um, moment that, you know, hits home. And it's just the opportunity to recognize that, like, even just, you know, a step or two earlier, um, I think is something that can give a lot of hope to individuals out there that they don't have to just keep running toward that moment. When you think about 
like some of the more common signs or like preambles to like you're your walking toward that moment. What are some of the, you know, little light bulbs that people should be looking out for that say, hey, you're starting to walk towards something that's, you know, potentially dangerous or traumatic or really a, a life shifting moment? Mm, great questions. So the first thing to recognize is that there's a shame and stigma surrounding burnout, mm. right? And it's, you know, this is one of those things that our society needs to change. And that is thinking of in terms of burnout as being, oh, you're weak, you're a failure, you don't have what it takes, or maybe, ooh, you're lazy and you just want some time off, right? And, and, and burnout on top of that was defined by Dr. Freudenberger back in the 70s is when he, he recognized what was happening to him. He only meant burnout in terms of workplace mm. burnout and only mental and emotional. Mm. Whereas, <laughs> right? Missing a couple buckets there. <laughs> Right, because the and and Dr. Christina Maslach, who has this you know beautifully crafted uh, burnout assessment scale, and even the World Health Organization have maintained that definition mm. of that it's only workplace related and it's only mental and emotional. And I can speak from my own personal experience and working with so many people before and since that that burnout is also very physical mm. and I'll, I'll get into those and, and <laughs> preach into the choir to you, Cole, to your, your listeners, right? They know that even if you're working, that's only one piece of the puzzle, right? That you, it could be, you're trying to juggle work and your child gets sick and needs to be home for the day, or maybe, you know, you fall and break a leg. Oh, you're throwing COVID there. How about parents getting sick with cancer or Alzheimer's or your spouse or partner, right? In other words, life happens. Life happens. And it's way more than just workplace. So I actually coined the term flame out syndrome. Mm. <laughs> after, after a plane because in aviation terms flame out refers to it's not just with sports teams <laughs> which is where you usually hear it now it's an aviation term that means that you it's what happens if you lose one or more power and en power to one or more of your engines mm. and that you may be able to pull out of it but if you can't pull out of it you're going to crash and burn Mm. Right. So that is why I guess I have this pet peeve. With, oh, it's not just workplace. Yeah. So one of the most important things to recognize is that the mental or emotional challenges that we're facing, whether it's feeling overwhelmed, will, whether it's feeling anxious, depressed, angry, you know, blowing up at your spouse, how about your boss? or your kids, much as you don't like to think about that, right? Or, or crying at the drop of a hat, or just you can't sleep. The COVID-20 that everyone likes to talk about, it's not just because we've been eating like all our comfort soup foods while we're at home. It's because stress causes us to pack on the pounds because mm -hmm. your, your body and your brain think that you are in starvation mode, right? It's like you, well, it's our, it's survival mode. Yeah. So you, it, it wants to preserve energy. It wants to preserve energy for you in case you are starving. Yeah. Right. So, so looking at early signs, the mental and emotional burnout is really like the canary in the coal mine. Are you familiar with that term? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for your listeners, it's, it's a phrase that goes back to as late as the, well, in the 1980s, late eighties, even miners, coal miners would take a canary in a cage 
poor guy down <laughs> in the mine with them and be singing along. La, 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 la. Sounds way better than I do. And the miners knew that if the bird stopped singing or keeled over, that they had to get out right away because if they didn't, they would be next yeah. because the bird was way more sensitive to the toxic fumes than the miners were. So really the harbinger of the catastrophic version, flame out syndrome is really those, those emotional signs and symptoms, the mental, the brain fog, because when you are in survival mode, which is what chronic, what acute or chronic stress is, right? Your unconscious, your not your unconscious, your your prefrontal cortex. It's a fancy way of saying your executive rock star team. <laughs> your ability, your ability to think logically, uh, come up with creative solutions, make good decisions act on those decisions, even be motivated to act on those decisions. Oh, and emotional regulation so that you're not flying off the handle so that you can focus, right? And you can remember things, right? All of that gets wiped offline. And we want that to happen physiologically because it's part of our survival response. We are all hardwired to either go into fight, what I call the Hulk, <laughs> right I need to smash something or we we go into flight I need to check out of here I'm gone or I'm paralyzed with fear like a rabbit and it's like oh my goodness what if what if what if what if what if or you know we faint roll over play dead which is the equivalent of you know somebody who grinds to a halt and sits on a mm. on their couch for hours and hours watching reruns and and stuffing their face full of comfort food like potato chips. What is that? That lays, you can only bitch can't eat just one. <laughs> They're serious so, about it. <laughs> yeah. So, and so in other words, we are hardwired to react the very same way as animals do. And it's all meant to keep us alive because in that first moment, in a millisecond after perceiving the threat, we go into whatever survival mode we're hardwired for. And, you know, so our muscles, you know, our blood will shunt to our muscles so we can fight or run. Our pupils will dilate so we can see better. Our heart rate will start beating faster to start pushing the blood around. Right? All of that is very, very necessary. And we want it to happen. And that's not the time to be thinking at all. Right. Like, right. oh, let me think about this for a second. Mm, should I stand and fight that saber tooth tiger or should I run? Right. Right. Because guess what? You're going to be. <laughs> lunch <laughs> lunch exactly and so that's our adrenaline that's our superpower and we want that that is that stereotypical 98 pound mother being able to lift a car off her pinned child right that is our superpower you couldn't pay that mom to do it a million dollars the next day or the day after if her kid wasn't there right right so it's important that we understand that our stress responses are actually really good things. The challenge is that we are the only humans who spend whatever, say 55% of the time dwelling on the past and all the awful things that happened, including the traumas or that fight with our spouse or boss or worrying about the future, like say 35, 40% of the time, worrying about the future and the what ifs. What if, what if I can't pay my mortgage on time this, this month? What if my boss doesn't give me that raise or you know, what did he mean when he called me in like you know, without telling me what it was about? Or what if little Johnny doesn't pass school? What if, right? 99.99999% of the time, <laughs> what we worry about doesn't come true. So we spend most of our time and our energy focusing and, and, and wasting our energy on stuff that we can't do anything about. The past can't be changed and the future is in the future. Right. So right then and there, and then you add, oh, life like COVID, 
right? And curveballs and adversity. And you get walloped upside the head with it. And it's just, it can like just send you spinning. Yeah. Right? Because all of your energy has been wasted on all of these other challenges, right? So that, and when you are in that stress, when you are dwelling on the past and and everything negative that happened in the past, when you're dwelling on the future and everything negative that can go wrong in the future, what are you doing? You're putting yourself into survival mode. What happens? (laughs) Your executive rock star team gets wiped offline. So that's why people will complain about brain fog. I went to the kitchen, opened the fridge door, and I stood there (laughs) looking at it going, why am I here? (laughs) Or have you ever like went to go put the kettle in the fridge? Or (laughs) I I have, I have, I admit it. Right. So in other words, brain fog, not being able to think straight, like, and focus not being able to to think logically, make good decisions, come up with those creative solutions that would get you out of the jam that you you're yeah. in, right? All of that gets wiped offline. So that can be one of those, as you were asking, those are like those harbingers, yeah, like right of what's yeah. coming. And then the insomnia, mm. not being able to sleep. And it's not just, anxiety and overwhelm and racing mind that's part of it your cortisol hormone which is your stress hormone remember the adrenaline is what keeps you going in those first few minutes and it can only last so long and then if the stress response continues cortisol ramps up and one of the side effects of cortisol is that it ruins your sleep cycle Mm. So you may be exhausted. Was it wired and tired? Mm. You just can't sleep. It also increases your blood sugar, right? Again, it's part of that stress response that you want because you need the blood sugar up to feed your brain, to feed your muscles. The challenge is if it goes on too long, it can lead to diabetes. Just as the increased heart rate, the increased blood pressure, if it goes on too long, can lead to cardiovascular disease. And just because of what cortisol does, it also causes you to pack on the pounds. Hmm. So you can be doing everything right, and you may find yourself gaining weight. So these are super important clues, right? Because I think in wow. I mean, I think a lot of parents can identify with maybe all, if not like pieces of the puzzle that you just mentioned, um, as present and okay. So now we have eyes on what some of those like warning signs are. Mm -hmm. How do we start to shift to something that's different than that? And like the pra- like how do we start to actually make change that moves us into something different than that chronic or acute stress response? Mm. It is, and you used one of my favorite words. Yes. <laughs> you know it's my favorite word. Yes. That word. That's good. I love that word. Because I created, after realizing that I was de- designed for success and set up for failure, by my programming, I realized that not only was I not alone, just like your listeners are not alone, that it's what set me up for crash and burn and burnout is the very same thing that keeps over 90% of people, like blocks over 90% of people from making lasting positive change in their life. Mm. And that is our programming, including our fears that we have been, you know, sponge, like just sucked in, Mm -hmm. um, our victim sabotage patterns, our limiting beliefs, again, usually to do with our programming, and then our trauma, the trauma that we has impacted us. And, and the first step 
into dealing before you can deal with anything else is we got to bring that executive rock star team back online mm. because you can't be in survival mode and be working and operating in success mode, which is having your rock star team going full steam. And so I use with my clients what I call SOS tools. Mm. And teach them, okay, what can you do in two seconds, in 30 seconds, in less than a minute, in five minutes, in 10 minutes? How can you quickly ground and center and calm those five alarms that are going on in your emotion center, feeling overwhelmed and anxious and stressed and depressed and angry so that you can start thinking straight? so that you can make good decisions and so that you can act on those good decisions, right? So you have to have that first. And, and as I mentioned, I'm a meditation instructor and I have like I don't know, 11 meditations, including six sleep meditations because it's so important. I, I saw. <laughs> on the app on Insight Timer. And, and I'll be the first to say, and this isn't just me saying this, it's been corroborated by the Hans Selye Foundation and the Canadian Institute for Stress. Dr. Hans Selye is the father of stress. He's the one that did all of this research. And he showed that meditation is like the last thing that you should be doing, right? So we always think, yeah, yeah, I should be doing self-care. I should meditate. I should, I should, I should. You know what they say, shouldn't shit all over yourself. And the reality is when you're in that hardwired stress response and you're in Hulk mode, right? The last thing you, you want and you'll put up with is somebody saying, ah, just relax, go like sit and like meditate for an hour. Right. They'll be like, no, I got to smash something. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> It's a real long time to out of the gate, go sit for an hour or two. <laughs> right. They'll be like, hell no. Am I like, heck no. Yeah. Right. That ain't happening. Or if you are in run mode, right. Again, you're not going to slow down. You're too busy worrying about the what ifs. Like you'll be like, I, I can't sit and meditate. It's like, I can't stop my monkey mind chatter. It's just like, it's going, it's going, it's going, it's going, it's going. I can't focus. Or you'll be like, oh, I just fall asleep every time I try to meditate, mm. which might actually be a good thing for, you know, at least in <laughs> yeah. some ways. Please like, get some rest. <laughs> some rest. Yeah. Right. So in other words, meditation is generally like traditional meditation is not the best thing for uh, stress. In fact, when I do my, in my recorded meditations, I have created unique binaural beats that are based on the he healing frequency of the brain, 40 Hertz. For those of you who want to know, scientifically validated again, former client and friend of mine researched that uh, head of music at University of Toronto. Awesome. Dr. Lee Bartel, by the way, Lee, if you're listening. And, and so I created unique binaural beats to help and train the brain down from that high beta, that high stress down into alpha, down into theta, so that you can start thinking creatively. That's about the only time I recommend it. Mm. Even so, it's it's I prefer to teach these SOS tools first so that people have a way that they can, as I said, seconds. What is the yeah. fastest, yeah. easiest, most powerful way that you can kickstart your executive team? I'm excited that this podcast is brought to you by mkforhealth.com. Have you been looking for a powerful antioxidant to help support your immune health? Hello, of course we have. Look no further. mkforhealth.com offers an amazing product called Nutrametrics OPC3. This product is an isotonic capable food supplement chock full of powerhouse antioxidants. Ingredients like citrus extract bioflavonoids, bilberry, grapeseed, red wine, and pine bark extracts, all incredible antioxidants. Then you have the OPCs, the oligomeric proanthrocyanidins are bioflavonoids found in fruits, vegetables, and certain tree barks that have exceptional benefit to the human body. Studies have shown that these OPCs 
are up to 20 times more powerful than vitamin C and 50 times more powerful than vitamin E in neutralizing free radicals. Hello, sign me up for that. Nutrametrics OPC3 also contains the only isotonic form of pigogenol in the world. Number one, remember, isotonic, readily absorbed. Number two, pigogenol, my new favorite word, is a natural plant extract from the bark of a French marine thyme pine tree, and it is the most clinically researched and potent bioflavonoid found. If you're ready to support your immune health and modulate inflammation in your system, all with incredible powerhouse antioxidants, natural extracts, and ingredients, whew, this is your product. Go to www.mkforhealth.com to purchase your Nutrametrics OPC3 today. That's www.mk, the number four, health.com. Can you share a couple with us? Because I think for our Absolutely. audience, like they're going to be like, whoa, there's an opportunity to change this that doesn't take hours, days, weeks, months. Like what, what are some of the ways that like in the moment when I feel that, when I feel the overwhelm or I feel the humming in my body, like that there's maybe something I can do, boom, right now. I, I think that would be huge <laughs> for them to have tools that support that. Absolutely. I'll just start teaching and you can tell me when you're <laughs> right. Oh, I love teaching this stuff. Really, truly keeping in mind, I'm going to say this beforehand. Some of these you have to, it's best if you are used to them mm. so that you actually think of them or you don't even have to think about them. Mm. Right. In other words, it's kind of like flossing your teeth, right? You need to get in the habit of doing it. So I recommend if at all possible, starting to do these techniques at a time, well, any time is better than no time. And preferably when you're not like stressed up the wazoo. Okay. Because that's probably not the time you're going to think about it. Yeah. I've been there myself. It's like, you know, you get into that, that knee jerk stress response and you're not thinking. However, as soon as possible, think about this or better yet, buddy up with somebody so that you can help each other. Mm. Right. So the very first thing is your actions, create your feelings. Actions, create feelings. Now, now Cole, I, I have a feeling that, you know, some military people. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so why is it that they spend so much time focusing on new recruits and posture. Because mm, posture has a massive impact on lots of like internal sensation, release of hormones. Yeah. Absolutely. In simple terms. And this has been corroborated by Harvard Business. They did research on this, that, that not only if you spread yourself out and stand tall and straight, others will view you as more successful and more, it's more smarter and smarter, right? Really what it's doing is it's sending the message to yourself, right? It's not just your body language doesn't just talk to others. It talks to yourself. So so listeners do this like, and, and Cole, like, you know, sitting or standing, it's like, and one reason I stand is for that reason, but, you know, just allow sitting or standing slump over, you know, maybe put your hands on your head, you know, maybe chin down and, and frown and see how that makes you feel. Right. Yeah. And then sit up straight, stand up straight, shoulders down away from your ears, chin up, smile on your face, gaze straight forward. And how do you feel? And if you spread your arms out, spread your legs out like Da Vinci's man, you know, maybe if you're alone in your kitchen, give a little dance, right? Yeah. It's like you're spreading yourself out and up. And what the message you're sending to yourself is I'm confident. I'm calm. I'm focused. I've got this. It's showtime. Mm. That is why the military spends so much time taking new recruits who are typically young 
and spend so much time teaching them about posture so that they can feel confident and charge into battle as needed and possibly risk their lives. Hmm. Right. So your actions create your feelings. And a good example of this is when you're frowning, the frown muscles send the message to your brain. Oh, I'm unhappy. Hmm. Right. So your brain changes the neurochemistry in your brain to match that. If you smile, and if you're not feeling like smiling, stick a pencil between your teeth. <laughs> right? And what it does is it forces your face into a smile and, and activating your smile muscle sends the message up to your brain oh, she's happy. I better release some serotonin, some happy neurotransmitters. And, and right. Yeah. In other words, your brain literally changes the neurochemistry based on your body language, including smiling. Yeah. And it actually makes you stronger. I love these literally ones. physically stronger. Yeah. I mean, these examples are so cool because I'm even imagining as you're sharing these, like, what does it look like to, you know, either put a smile on my face or stick that pencil in if I need to, while I'm making dinner or what is it, you know, while I'm driving the car shoulders back, like let's get nice and tall in the car. Like there's all these places where it's really actually super easy to start running the loop of this, right. To get that habit formation going. Oh, which also by the way is going to feel good. Like in the moment while we're doing it. Yeah. And you also look really silly. Right. <laughs> right. Let the kids it's think you're weird. Please, right. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a small little thing. And I have clients, I actually have like whole families that I've, I've helped and they, they have like a, a code phrase is like stick a pencil in it. The kids are allowed to say it to the parents. The parents are allowed to say it to the kids. They have my permission. They know oh it. My kids God. aren't going to get in trouble for saying it to the parents. <laughs> I wrote that down. I'm like, need that on a t-shirt, I think. Stick a pencil in it. That's like my yes. thing. <laughs> Yeah, baby. And so so that is the very first and most important. And and in, and you think about it, like think about sports teams. What do they do when they, you know, pre-game, they go into their huddle, you know, they're, <laughs> what do they do? They break and they're like, huh, or yes, or yeah. Right? In other words, they do a power move. They do a power move. And it's, it's not just to intimidate the other team. Yes. They want to do that as much as possible. It's also to get themselves into state. It's basically teaching themselves. It's showtime. Right. And you don't have to be military. You don't have to be a performer. You don't have to be an athlete to need showtime. It can be just when you're like yeah. run ragged with your kids and, and you've had a long day at work and, and you still need to show up for the rest of the day. Right. And that showtime may be showing up as the best mom, the best dad, or maybe you're tired from your kids keeping you up and you need to go into work. Yeah. So create a, a power move and it, a power move is whatever means something to you. Like there are people that I, I don't know if this is going to be video or if it's going to be just audio only, you know, where they might smack their, their, their fist into their hand and go, yes, or they'll do an elbow pump or they'll pump their, their fist up in the air. I'm more passive than that and peaceful in that. And so as part of my acupuncture, your conception vessel is part of your life energy. And so my power move is literally zipping up my mm. conception vessel. And, I love that. and the beautiful part of it is when you get used to doing that power move, you can create like a little mini power move that nobody else sees. Mm. And it'll be just enough, right? You're, you've gotten your brain used to, oh, oh she's doing the move. It's showtime, right? So I've literally, <laughs> when I was doing my, my medical board exams, the bell ringers, and you, they have you stand outside this door and there's like 
some information you have to read on the door and behind it is this mystery patient that you have to diagnose <laughs> and do this and do this and do this all in like space of a few minutes. Yeah. And I'm standing in front of that door. And yes, I did this. I spread myself out in the bathroom before, right? To get myself in state. Yeah. And then as I'm standing in front of the door, I was literally like just moving my hand just a little bit. It was like, mm. you know, nobody could see what I was doing. It was enough to mimic my big power move that it was sending the message to my brain. It's showtime. And those okay. are things that you can do, you add in, and I'm, I'm just going to keep go, go, going here and, and fit as many of these in as possible. Sing like no one's listening. Mm. Because not only does it make you feel great, choosing, very importantly, choosing upbeat music that means something happier times to you. Mm. Because not only does the happier music switch off the, the five alarm fires going on in your brain when you sing whether you think you can sing or not your voice box is innervated by the main nerve in your body that uh, governs what's called rest and digest it's opposite of the stress response so when you start singing you are literally putting your body into rest and digest mode so Add in a little hip wiggle, get <laughs> yeah. moving. I don't care if you're driving, I don't care what people think around you, just sing to whatever and just have a grand old time. I highly recommend that everyone build a list of fun, positive, upbeat songs that they use, whether it's for exercising, whether it's driving, whether it's while they're listening, you know, they're, they're cooking dinner, whatever it is, anytime you need, just get moving your booty and sing like no one's listening. Yeah. Little simple things. Cause guess what? That is active mindfulness. Right. All of the, right. And, right. So it's, it's literally active mindfulness just simply means that you are in the present moment. Because you can't be singing to your good, 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 good vibrations, singing that and, and be worrying about like what's happening in the future, dwelling on the past. So true. <laughs> right? So, so true. It's, it's why it's, these are so simple and so powerful. And I mean, I could keep going. Yeah, I mean, Dr. those I mean, this are like so important. Just even those guys, just put so, those into action. And something that's like landing so hard on me as you're describing these is the opportunity to lead our families by example with mm, some of these yes. things. Oh my goodness. Like, Hey, you look like, you know, I can just imagine like a kiddo coming into the car after school or whatever, and maybe having more of like that slumped posture or, you know, just visibly kind of down and together with them, like, Hey, let's, let's talk about it. What happened today? But like, get yourself into the posture. I'm just imagining like all the little ways you could start to connect that for mm -hmm. young people who then are building that pattern that they're not having to learn specifically as an adult and like what a power move that is as a parent <laughs> to really oh, support in that way. Oh my gosh, what a gift. Oh, yeah. The only way we truly lead is by example. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and I highly recommend doing this before asking them about their day. <laughs> yes. Because you're hardwired for negativity. And so your kid will automatically start going, well, little Johnny did this. And, and such and such said that this wasn't my, they weren't my friend or, or the teacher like got upset. Right. It's like, no, no, yeah. get them in a good state first. Yeah. I love get them in a good state first. I've noticed you use that specific word state. And I think that will really resonate for a lot of people because once you can identify that your state is something other than present or calm or <laughs> relaxed, like once you can identify it as something other than that, oh my goodness, like the thought of like with your own tools and practices, being able to almost automatically shift out of that state Mm -hmm. and land at a different state is really exciting. And I think empowering for people to hear like, oh, guess what? <laughs> like flex the muscles on that. Like 
I get to do that. That's pretty exciting. I'm not just subject to the feeling state that I'm having, but I can mm-hmm. have a choice that brings me to something different. I think that's really exciting for people to think about in that way. Absolutely. And you said more of my favorite words. <laughs> actually said, I get to do this and choice because that in my five-step blueprint to shift from stress to success, the SOS tools are step number one. Step number two is recognizing that you always have choice and control in every given moment. It may not be the choice and control you want, mm. and it's still there because otherwise, if you don't, then you're in victim mode. And nobody wants to believe they are in victim mode, but guess what? We all do it. Yeah. And, and it simply just means where in your life are you feeling powerless, mm. out of control, victimized like life is being done to you right and and what we don't realize is yes there's the big parts can anybody say the c word for the last couple years (laughs) right and at the same time we also do it to ourselves with our languaging without even realizing how many times do we say i have to go to the grocery store yeah i have to do this or i can't do that right Nobody can force you to do anything short of drugging you. You may not like the choices you have, and yet you always have that choice of even if it's just how you respond. One of my heroes, Dr. Viktor Frankl, who survived four Holocaust death camps, had everything taken from him, lived in constant fear of dying, dehumanized, you name it. And he said, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, his ability to think and respond at any given moment. Mm. So the words have power. Instead of saying, I have to go to the grocery store, or I have to work two jobs, or I have to, I must, I need to. How about just, I'm going to the grocery store. Mm. Better yet, I get to go to the grocery store. I get to work two jobs so that I can put my kids through school and give them a better start than perhaps I did. Because how many people don't have that opportunity or the money to go to the grocery store or to even work two jobs to put their kids through school, right? In other words, changing that. The next thing I am is so powerful. So when you say I am depressed, I am anxious, I am stressed. That's literally saying that's who you are, right? It's a permanent state. So the French have a way of saying, j'ai foi. Or j'ai faim. In other words, I have hunger. I have mm. cold. Right. In other words, so that's better than I am. Better yet is I recommend to my clients to pretend that, you know, to view their, their life on a reality TV screen, yeah. right? That you are the star of this amazing re- <laughs> reality TV show. And, you know, where the, the truth is, is stranger than fiction often. <laughs> and by just viewing it outside of yourself and go, oh, there's that anxiety. Hmm. Ooh, there's jealousy, fear. I don't know what that means. Hmm. Right? It takes the sting out of it, number one, and it no longer controls you. You know, ever have like those thoughts that think you or those emotions that are feeling you, right? When you start viewing them outside and just observing them, they no longer control you. It doesn't mean that you have to stop them. Remember, that's the mindfulness part. And just go, huh, without judgment. I wonder what that's about. Yeah. Right? By saying that, or people will say, oh, my cancer, my arthritis. Right? You're not going to be able to get rid of anything that you own. Right. So you might think you want to heal from my cancer, but guess what? Your unconscious mind is going, hell no, it's part of me. Right. And it anchors to like a permanence and there's nothing in this life that's permanent except for change. (laughs) So yeah. yeah, And and death, death is a final, and even that's probably arguable, right? Like depending on what your belief system is after that. No, no, for sure. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, what to shift the power around those states, especially if you don't want it to be a permanent state to really think about it being like, It is now. (laughs) Interesting. I I noticed the curiosity that you immediately like activated toward that thing 
okay, so we're three steps in. I need to know the last two steps before I'm going to let you go today because this is just too good. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I will just finish off by saying that that's very interesting. One of my favorite phrases, it is what it is. Mm. And I've heard like Joe Vitale say that, you know, he hates, he, he went on about how much he hates that and he feels it's a victim phrase. All it is is saying it is what it is. This is, that's the current reality based on the past. The next part of that is now what? Mm. Right. Just like so many people can say me too, which is an important step of awareness. But then after that, there has to be now what? Mm. Right. So the now what step number three is creating a vision for your life a vision for your life that is the vehicle for your fulfillment and your growth and it's best. And again, Harvard has, has shown this, that the, the, the further out you create a vision and the bigger you create a vision, the more successful you're going to be and the more fulfilled you'll be. And in neurological terms, when you create a vision Functional MRI shows that your executive rock star team kicks up, kicks online and goes, okay, we have a challenge. Mm. Thanks for giving us a destination, boss. We're ready to go. <laughs> Those are marching that. orders, <laughs> right? So you need to have a vision first and foremost, not just a goal. A goal is something that you're comfortable with. I'm going to lose five pounds in five weeks, Right. A vision is that vision that stretches you and forces you to expand into it because nature abhors a vacuum. So think back to a beautiful genius of a baby that you were born as and think about the infinite potential that you had as a baby and what vision is big enough to fit that infinite potential of that amazing soul uh -huh. right so dream big you know and, and and don't allow the peanut gallery the inner judge and jury to go well who are you to think that you can have a nobel peace prize or that you can transform billions of people's lives or that you can have a private jet or have a, a an island home like you know your inner judge and jury the peanut gallery will go who are you to uh -huh. think that who are you not to think that Marianne Williams had said that yes, who are yes. you not to believe that? And I'll paraphrase and, and put my own spin on it as that amazing genius with your own unique set of talents and gifts and intellect. Are you not to believe that you can do anything? You don't have to do it tomorrow, right? The whole purpose of a vision is to stretch you into becoming who you mm. need to become to be, do what you need to do to have what you want to have. And that includes experiences, not just material. So if you don't have a vision of your own that you're working on, you're just a worker bee in somebody else's vision, mm. guaranteed. And then very, very important on so many levels, it's not good enough just to have the target. You need to why. You need to know why, why am I going there? So you need your big why, your ikigai, as I say in Japanese, in French, it's your raison d'etre, your big reason. What is your reason for living, for getting up every single morning, for continuing to keep going when the going get tough as it always does, right? So your why is that important you know, push. Nietzsche said that he who has a why can endure almost any how. And neurologically, because I'm a science geek, yeah. neurologically, when you add in big purpose along with your vision and you give that challenge to your executive rock star team in your brain, the prefrontal cortex lights up on functional MRI. It's more than just two plus two equals four. It's like two plus two equals 10. Mm. Like it just, boof, it's like, wow, just lights up. And if you don't have your purpose, you're lost. Yeah. Right. You're not going anywhere. You're just spinning your wheels because your unconscious mind is going to go, well, you don't know why you want that vision. So you're not having it. 
Hmm. And it will block you. Cause it was just like, no, that doesn't make sense, dude. Yeah. The final, the final step is belief. Hmm. What do you need to believe about yourself? And I said, what do you need to believe? Because if it's outside of your comfort zone and it's outside your current identity, chances are your belief is going to be low in the beginning. Yeah. So what do you need to believe about yourself and your capability to master your vision? What do you need to believe about others? Will they support you? Do they need and want the value that you are offering, the contribution that you're offering? And then what do you need to believe about the possibility of your big dream coming true? Mm. And if you don't have those five steps and belief, well, they're all massive steps, but if you don't have belief in either yourself, in others, or the possibility, you're just stopped, stopped mm. dead. And it's just wishful thinking. So those are the five steps. Oh my gosh. I just love it so much. And I think I appreciate um, you highlighting the different aspects of some of those too, because like, even when, when you first said belief, I was like, yeah, what do you need to, you know, in my mind, I'm like, okay, what is the thing you need to believe about yourself? But I think even something as nuanced as like, what do I have to believe about the possibility like that? Oh my gosh. It's like, even just hearing you say that my own brain was like, boom, ex explosive, like, whoa, <laughs> there's new things there. <laughs> well, yeah, because we have like this thing, right? I, I, again, I'm a geek. I admit it. And the Johnny Depp, when he played Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory, and the first time he said, you know, this phrase, you know, you're like, wow, is he like off his rock or what? Because somebody would say, well, you can't do that. You go, you know, I really hate it when you mumble because I can't understand a single thing when you mumble. And then he said it again after someone, he said, well, that's impossible. He said, you know, I really hate it when you mumble. I can't understand a single thing when you mumble. I, I, after that movie, I kept saying that to my kids and they understood, they knew it right then. It was like, okay, quit saying that. Yeah. Right? yeah. Because Nelson Mandela said, everything seems impossible. That is until someone does it. Yeah. And then the whole world goes, oh, it's possible. So we're going to do it. And they do it. Yeah. And that's been proven. So you have a choice. You can either hold back and be the, the cautious, conservative, pessimistic, doubting Thomas or doubting Thomas Cena, you know, and go prove it to me. Or you can wait until somebody else does it. And go, oh, well, obviously that's true. I, I, that's, he's pr proven to me. I can do that. Or you can believe it to see it. Yeah. Roger Bannister, when he said everyone believed it was impossible to run a four minute mile and he did it in subpar conditions after working a full day in a lab, he was a medical student. He didn't have the fancy outfits and shoes that we do now. It was raining, the track was muddy, and he still ran a four minute mile. Why? Because he believed that he could. And as soon as he did it, people all around the world started running four minute miles. Yeah. Right. And before that, it was believed that it was physiologically impossible. So, there are people listening who may feel like, well, you know, the doctor said it's impossible for me to heal or that it's impossible for little Johnny to, to be valedictorian because he's slow or has a learning disability or, 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 right? Don't pay attention. I was told that my son <laughs> was catastrophic brain injury and yes, he is missing like, a good third of his left hemisphere. I've seen the spec scans, made me cry. And the neurosurgeon on the top said, he's not gonna walk again, he's not gonna talk again, and he's not gonna pass high school. And that awoke the mama bear. <laughs> and I was like, like we're about to prove you wrong <laughs> I was like yeah we'll see about that so I went and got every certification I need whatever answer I needed I went looking for 
and including becoming certified in brain injury because I got sick and tired of the experts saying, it's okay, mom, we're the experts. We know what's best for your son. No, you don't. No, you don't. I know my son. I know what's necessary and what's needed. And he's doing this. And I taught him from the very beginning, you're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to work hard. No doubt about it. And guess what? You are already a genius. And when the going gets tough and everyone else is tempted to stop because they've never had to work that hard, you're just going to keep going because from the time he was four years old, he had 10 hours minimum of therapy and tutoring a week on top of school hmm. from four years old. And now he not only walks and talks, he's in his fourth year of engineering. Ah, so awesome. <laughs> yes. That is the power of belief. Yeah. So question, 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 question. Don't allow others to determine what your life is going to be like, what your children's life is going to be like. Dream big for yourself, because as you said, Cole, you are modeling for your children. And if they see mom or dad playing small, guess what they're going to do? If they see mom or dad living and dreaming big, and yes, you're going to fail and fall down because guess what? That's what a baby does when it learns to walk, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Another bunch of programming to kick to the curb that, oh, I tried this once and you know, obviously I'm no good at it because I failed. So I'll just give up on this. Like, no, show them it's okay to fail. Show them it's okay to be vulnerable and, and say, you know what? I, I, mommy's not feeling great today. Guess what? And mommy's going to do some things to make her feel good. You want to help mommy? Yeah. We're about to dance in the kitchen and put a pencil between our teeth. It's going to get funky. <laughs> well, and you can see, I like to bring the fun, but here's the thing that I recognized after almost dying. I chose also in that moment that if something wasn't fun, I wasn't going to do it. That life wasn't worth living if it wasn't fun. I don't wait for fun to come to me. I bring the fun and I choose to find the fun, no matter what is happening in life. I'm one of those strange people that will laugh at funerals or, right, because the dead people, they're fine. Yeah. It's, in other words, we're the ones who need it. Yeah. So choose to find the fun, choose to find the gratitude, the appreciation, teach your kids to, instead of like, what went wrong at school today? Tell me five things that were awesome. And get them into that habit of looking at the good, looking at all the fun stuff. Ah, don't tell me about who did what. I want to know. What was the good stuff that happened? Yeah. And if there's only one thing, I want you to repeat it five times. <laughs> Just keep it going. <laughs> Let's yeah. find all the parts of it that were good. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Yeah. Which is another SOS tool, by the way. So oh, there you goodness. go. You got one last one for the road. I mean, to say that I could talk to you about this for a lot longer. I mean, I want everyone to go to your site. I want them to find you on all the places. Where should they look? Because I think... So much of what you said is so um, like usable right this instant and allows a new way of being like as you're becoming to like start happening now. I think that's just so exciting for people. So where should they um, look to find more about you and the work that you do and all the good stuff that you shared with us today? Mm, thanks, Cole. It's been such a pleasure. So my website, it's in the midst of being redeveloped and it's uh dr irene cop.com d-r-i-r-e-n-e-c-o-p.com that was like a spelling test for my brain <laughs> and and i'm on linkedin i'm on instagram i'm on facebook and i have a weekly master class series that they can register for even if they just get the recordings and that is https colon forward slash forward slash dr irene d-r-i-r-e-n-e dot life forward slash masterclass 
So we have that weekly masterclass where either I talk or I bring on other amazing world-class experts. And it's all about helping you live your best life and shift into success mode in your career, in your wealth, in your health and your energy, your relationships, your personal life. Amen. Yes, everyone. Okay. We will make sure to share all of that in the show notes because I definitely want everyone to access just this amazing work that you're doing and be able to apply it and start to shift their own experience from stress and to success because all of us, you know, in our hearts want that experience. And so now here it is at our fingertips, right? That's so exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, I just thank you so much, Dr. Irene. It was really lovely to get to, um, really just intangible ways. Like, ah, I'm just so excited. I'm already like brainstorming in my own house. You know, what do some of these really simple practices get to look like and, and the fun. I just appreciate that you, yeah. Highlighted that may, yeah. Life can seem really serious shifting out of stress and into success. I mean, even that can feel like, oh gosh, I got some work to do. Right. But, oh, like, let's have some fun doing that. I'm just really grateful that you shared that as well. So thank you so much for your time. I'm really great back and tell us what you did too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Keep it and share the list. Yeah. I'll, I'll put that when we share everything, like share the, your own personal list because others can use that too of the strategy. So excellent. Thank you so much. I hope you have an awesome day. I thank you for your time. I thank everyone listening for their time um, being with us here uh, today and we will catch you guys next time.